So we should be talking about from talk to launch and uh, you mean please. Hello, is there sound? How do we go about building the feature and ensuring that it provides value to our users and is a good experience and also scalable? We'll get to that in my talk today um, and where I will give you a peek into the life cycle of a feature and what it looks like to go from thought to launch. And hopefully by the end of it, you will have a good understanding of how we build features with a focus on scoping and development over here at GitHub, where we serve millions of developers every day. So the first stage of a future life cycle is the idea stage. Where do we get them? There are tons of sources. So I'll just name a few that come to mind. GitHub community, Twitter, OSS maintainers, user interviews, data from user behavior, and internally with GitHub staff as we you know, build the tool that we're using, um, and as well as GitHub stars. So yeah, a bunch of screenshots where we get data. So once we've settled on the idea, the next stage is the scoping stage. How do we start the process of turning an idea from into tangible pieces of work that can be assigned and worked on uh, by designers, engineers, product managers, researchers? To help illustrate the process, I will use a real life example that I was involved in building out two years ago. Uh, let's launch GitHub sponsors in four months. There are usually three constraints to project management, people, time and scope. And most of the time, two of these three constraints are fixed. So you're left with only one that you have wiggle room on. Going back to our you know, example of launching GitHub sponsors in four months, the time constraint is fixed. Um, and assuming staffing resources have been allocated, you now have scope left that you can play around with. One of the first things that we do when figuring out the scope of users or, or the scope of a feature is who are our users? Who are we trying to build this feature for? And what are their needs? Knowing that we have four months to launch GitHub sponsors, what is the smallest set of users that we can meaningfully build for? And so we settled on individual sponsorships. So individual sponsors sponsoring individual developers, or as we call it, sponsored developers. Now that we've identified the smallest set of users, I think y'all have seen this use of. Um, He's come to talk before Evan Yu, a very, one of our very first um, OSS maintainers that we onboarded into GitHub sponsors. Um, so yeah, now that we've identified our smallest set of users, we need to figure out what matters most to them that intersects with the overarching feature that we are trying to build. And that is for, for GitHub sponsors to be meaningful to our maintainers, we want to provide a platform for them to be able to talk about their work and also provide sponsorship levels that funders can sponsor their work for. And as for our potential sponsors, don't tell him I haven't sponsored him, but as for our potential sponsors, we want to provide them a way to browse different profiles and actually fund their work um, through a selected sponsorship level that they are comfortable with. So consider these the bare minimum that we need to build out within a given time period. So then we ask ourselves, how much time do we have? How much time do we have to build this functionality that we just scoped out? Is there a hard deadline uh, or do we have some flexibility to play with? In our case, uh, GitHub Satellite, which is a huge event for us, it's like Apple Keynote, but for GitHub, 
um, it was in four months. So we didn't really have a choice. We had to get it shipped in four months. So this was, and GitHub Satellite is like where big announcements happen. So we can't like, you know, backtrack like, oh no, just kidding. We're not shipping GitHub sponsors. Um, so yeah, it was a really tight deadline. With the clock ticking, we had to be even more discerning about what our must-haves are versus our nice-to-haves. One definite must-have uh, was that maintainers must be able to receive funds from sponsors, and sponsors must be able to fund maintainers via self-service checkout with a credit card. Thankfully, we were able to leverage some existing systems that were built out for another product that we had called GitHub Marketplace. So a lot of the billing internals were already built out, and we could build upon that. Uh, an example of a nice to have would be displaying confetti when someone sponsors a maintainer. Uh, it was a nice way to show appreciation and celebrate their contribution, but it wasn't necessary. I mean, you know, spoiler alert, we actually built it out later, but not within the launch. Uh, after deciding on the minimal bio viable product, the MVP that we need to build out, we need a way to organize the work. So at GitHub, we rely heavily on GitHub projects to track our work and progress. Uh, I kind of created, you know, a project board for y'all. And just to give you an idea of like the kinds, the views that are available for on GitHub projects. And it's a way to get a bird's eye view into what the team is working on and its progress. And it's highly customizable. It supports different views that collaborators on the repository or organization um, that creates it can, can work on. And one of the two views I often use, or we often use, is the Kanban board style, where issues, you know, move from left to right uh, in terms of like the stages of development. So going from the backlog to ready for development to in progress, and then goes through review, and then it's done. And the second view, uh, it's pretty new. This kind of view uh, is a list of issues, and you can sort them and group them and filter them in a way that's meaningful to you. You can also add different fields that you care about and you know, populate this other view that might be useful for you. You can also add new views of, you know, maybe your product manager wants to see it in a different way than the engineering manager on your team. Zooming in, uh, we usually have issues of varying complexities and engineering effort involved. What we call ethics are usually big, long-term initiatives that can take three to six months. So an example of this would be Let's launch GitHub sponsors in the US. Now, tracking issues are part of ethics and usually take one to two months of work. And what that could look like is let's build out the maintainer profiles. And within tracking issues, you have smaller work items that are sometimes called batches of work. These typically take a week. And the idea behind this whole process is to break down a project into as small digestible chunks as you can that can be parallelized and worked on by members on the team. You can also apply labels and you know, add them to milestones to quickly give you a visual indication of how the project is going and what each work item might entail. Okay, now we're ready to get cracking. Uh, the next stage of the feature life cycle is probably the one that will be most interesting to you all, uh, which is the development stage. With most user-facing projects or features at GitHub, a cross-functional team of EPD is staffed. So that's engineering, product, and design. But in the interest of time and today's audience, I'm just gonna focus on the engineering aspects involved. Okay, so using the example from the previous scoping stage, we want to allow a maintainer to create their profile. Here's a design prototype of what this could look like for them uh, and you know what, so, so we kind of think about what are some possible fields that we are, we might care to kind of store in a database and capture. So it looks like there's a short bio section, an introduction, and then some other metadata around the maintainer's profile. Now, with any feature that we build, there are two, two important things to keep in mind how you write the data and how you retrieve the data. In our earlier example, where we wanted to enable the maintainer to create their profile, we want to write a database migration to create the tables that will store the information that we need um, to represent that profile. So one thing we could use is a slug, which is like a unique name and identifier for the listing. Uh, a state kind of tells us whether it's in a draft state or it's pending approval or it's been approved and is ready for publishing. 
a short bio, we call it short description, and then an introduction field, which we term long description or full description in our database. When it comes to database migrations though, we have to keep scalability in mind. As I mentioned earlier, GitHub has 80 million developers and it's growing. Um, and so even though maintainers and sponsors are only a subset of that, we have to think about scale constantly because you know, it will, we eventually will roll out globally uh, and we have. And so you wanna make sure that you preemptively build for scale in mind because fixing it later, fixing performance um, problems later is gonna be really, really tricky when you have existing users. So one way to build for scale uh, is to leverage database indexes in your migrations. We can do this by thinking about how we want to create a table in the future and add an index on a column or add composite indexes um, across multiple columns and depending on your use case. So for example, if I wanted to get all of the maintainer profiles that are in the approved state, I would probably add an index to the state column to improve the speed and efficiency of data retrieval. So I just threw a bunch of like, you know, theoretical words at you and hopefully, you know, we can talk about, I'll do a deeper dive now of how that actually works under the hood. So first things first, what is an index? A database index is a copy of selected columns of data from a table. The selected columns will be the same ones you specify in your database migration. And it is always sorted and thus you can very efficiently search through um, your database quickly. And it can be used to filter, sort, or retrieve data as well. On the left side is a very simple table populated with just basic information of a few maintainer profiles. So the ID, the record ID, the slug, or the unique name, as well as the state. And as a reminder, we are interested in retrieving the ones that are in the approved state. So it makes sense to add an index on state. And what we end up with is um, a copy of, the of only the columns of data, which is ID and state from the original table. So notice that it's sorted by state now with reference to the ID of the original records. Without an index, we would have had to do a full table scan of every record in the database and take note of which ones were approved in green and which ones aren't in red. And this can become very, very costly, when you, especially when you have millions of records to uh, do a full scan on. Whereas with an index on state, uh, we can quickly go to the chunk of you know, approved ones, check the ID, use the ID and map it back to the table. And so you don't, you don't have to do a full scan, you already know the subset of records that you care about. And then you can retrieve the information from there. To take it one step further, you could also choose to do a covering index on both the state and the slug. So that way you have the slug handy for lookup um, right there into your index. And you don't have to even you know, refer back to the original table. So there's a lot more to like database indexes, um, but in the interest of time, I won't be covering all of it, but there's a lot of information out there that you know, is, is just very fascinating about how you can improve the speed of queries through database indexes. Another thing to consider uh, for database migrations is the uniqueness of records based on certain columns. So for our case, you know, the slug or the sponsor, the maintainer's ID. Um, and in other words, that means like a maintainer shouldn't have more than one profile. And the maintainer also, uh, the, the, the slug or the name of their profile should always be unique. Also where applicable, like uniqueness constraints helps us to remove duplicates or or prevent duplicates in our table. And thus, you know, we all have faster retrieval. Because imagine if you had like three maintainer profiles with the same slug, now you have to go through all three and then figure out which one's the one you're talking about versus making it unique and you just, it's a uh, O of one lookup versus O of N. So after we run the migration and the table is created in the database, it's time to add application logic, uh, such as validations, a state machine, callbacks, and other considerations that might be helpful in ensuring that our records are valid before they get persisted into the database. So I'd like to touch upon why model validations are crucial when building out features uh, or a product, especially when we think about the large amounts of data that we have to store in the database. So they provide a database agnostic way to ensure that only valid data is saved into your database. So as to reduce the noise of unreliable data or corrupted data 
um, client side validations, uh, they, they're sometimes reliable. If you think about like the password checker on a website, right? Um, sometimes they can be bypassed because the user just doesn't have JavaScript on, turned on for their browser. So not the most reliable. And at the end of the day, if you can get as close to the data, the data layer as you can to ensure that the last um, round um, that you know the data goes through is where it gets cleaned and make sure that that's what you're going to persist in the database. And it also allows us to bubble up like the actual errors that a user might face and provide some feedback. So you give the user a chance to like you know update their um, or correct their um, the input before saving it. Tying it back to GitHub sponsors, we had a model validation on the number of sponsorship levels that you can provide in your maintainer profile. If we didn't have that, you can imagine that you know folks can have countless numbers of sponsorship levels, uh, which would mean an explosion in, of like records in your database. There's no way to like you know limit that um, later on, and it will also be a very bad user experience. Imagine having to scroll through like for Evan, you know. 100 over sponsorship levels, which one do I choose? So user experience wise, also terrible. So in summary, model validations are very important to provide some structure and control over the data that you store. And another important concept in building our feature is that of a state machine. So how many of you have built out a state machine for your application before? Okay, okay, okay this will be interesting, hopefully. Uh, so what is a state machine? Um, it is a programming architecture that allows a dynamic flow of states depending on the previous state and user inputs. Uh, and it is, it's a way to capture decision-making logic. So for a maintainer profile, they start out in the draft state. And at some point, um, they can you know, save the changes along the way. And then when they're ready, they can request for an approval. Um, at this point, they, they're maintainer profile goes from draft state into the pending approval state. And at that point, someone in the, you know, an admin or somebody who's looking through their profile, make sure that, you know, things look good. Um, they can either reject it and say like, you know, not enough data or like terrible data, please update your profile or they can choose to approve it. So then it transitions either back into draft or into the approved stage. Um, and at which point, you know, the maintainer can also unpublish it if they're not ready um, as well. So state machines are really widely used um, in the wild. Uh, I challenge you to think about them when you next use the ATM, or maybe you just use your mobile phone now, so maybe not as relevant, but, uh, or any, like, you know, you're shopping and you want to check out online, you're ordering food, like chi your chicha, whatever, uh, with Panda or Food Panda or Deliveroo. So you can think about the state machines that it can occur with, while you're checking out in the whole process. Uh, I included a meme. I don't know if it's relatable. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it soak in. Okay, so we touched upon how we write and persist the data. So now it's time to explore the other side of it. How do we retrieve that data? How do we ultimately present the data to the user in a form that makes sense to them or is interesting to them? And one common way that we do this is um, via the user interface on our platform. A lot of times we leverage the MVC framework, which is model, view, and controller. I'll pause here for a bit so you can kind of see how the controller sits between the model where your data logic or your data logic is and the view where that's where you're presenting to the user. But in the interest of time, I won't be doing a deep dive on this because there's just a ton of better resources out there that will provide you uh, with more than I can about this framework. This is, you know, for example, an example of a UI that will end up being what is presented to the user. Okay. So I'd like to touch upon another avenue that we can retrieve data that is not usually thought about, but very important, especially when you're building for scale. As GitHub is a platform that, you know, we encourage open source co uh, contributions and open source collaboration. We also, we, we thus provide a very, comprehensive GraphQL, uh, publicly accessible GraphQL API that users can tap into for their needs. GraphQL API is a query language for those who are not familiar uh, in server-side run runtime for APIs that prioritizes giving clients exactly what they need and nothing more. So it's you know very explicit, like what kind of data you want to uh, retrieve from the system. But because of that, 
um, we have to also be very careful about what data you, we can serve to the user depending on their roles and permissions. Yeah, it was developed by Facebook or Meta. I think in 2015, it was open sourced. Can we see that? Okay. In order to support that, um, we have to also consider uh, adding the GraphQL QL, like objects and APIs and the permissions layer when building out our feature, because if there's any intention to open it up to the public, that's something you want to like, you know, make sure that you develop and keep in mind. So for example, some sponsors might be interested in showcasing their sponsorships on their personal website. Um, so having a GraphQL API that they can, you know, kind of connect into and tap into to retrieve that information, they can then, you know, use that information and display it on their website in any form that they want to. But with great power comes great responsibility, right? So we have to ensure that the consumers of our GraphQL API um, have the right permissions to access the resource that they're interested in or perform certain actions. Uh, and here we get into the concept of building another, or, or another like, important concept in building software, which is authorization. This is the function of specifying access rights or privileges to certain resources based on uh, a user's role or the entity's role. Actually, I didn't really pay attention in school on this topic, but you know, since being at GitHub has been like oh, super important um, because you know, with the large scale that we are serving up, we want to make sure that we're keeping bad actors at bay. The, the most common use case is like what a logged out versus a logged in user can see. And coupling that with the example of GitHub sponsors, um, it also matters if you are a maintainer or a sponsor or both. So like user A is both a maintainer, a sponsor, and they're logged in. So what they can do is they can edit their own maintainer profile. They can view sponsorships. They can also fund other maintainers, view other maintainers profiles, or, and you know, view public sponsorships. So they have a lot of power. Um, you can kind of trace the same thing for user B, who's a sponsor, logged in user, and then the Randall who's logged out and can't really do much except for things that are public, publicly available. So again, I uh, wish I could go into more details about you know, role-based access control, but I don't want to be a snooze fest, so I'm going to be moving on. So we've now reached a point where we start to think about who we want this feature to be available for. Do we want to roll it out to specific users? Uh, do we want to roll it out internally or to certain repositories or organizations? Um, a lot of this we can do by leveraging what we call feature flags. Uh, at, at GitHub, we like our main application is a real monolithic application, very huge, very annoying to work with sometimes, but we make use of this Ruby gem called Flipper. Uh, that's the way that we can control feature flags, which gives us a suite of functionalities to control the rollout of our feature. Uh, this enables us to, you know, enable a feature for maybe one user or a group of users. So like, you know, maybe all admins at GitHub or all staff staff um, at GitHub will be able to see this feature first. And this will come in handy in my later slide. Um, or if you want it to act like a kill switch, like, oh no, you know, shit hits the fan and you're like, I you just need to like turn it off globally. You can also like enable or disable this as a global feature flag. And the advantage of this method is that you don't require any code changes. You don't require a whole like, you know, go through the whole deployment process for the code changes to be pulled out. It's just a configuration configuration change. So like just flipping the switch in the database somewhere. So we use this all the time. Any, any new feature that we're like experimenting with, feature flag, feature flag, feature flag. Okay, so now we have the tools to control how and who we roll out the feature to. But how do we confirm and double confirm that um, our feature actually works as, as expected? Um, how do we ensure that we're not rolling out a breaking change for our existing users? And here is where testing and the continuation, continuous integration comes into play. Testing usually falls into manual and automated. And within the automated testing, there's like unit tests, um, you know, different levels of testing. So the unit tests uh, is where you can test a small isolated chunk of application logic. Integration test is where you could, you know, it's still quite isolated, but now you're testing the interface with maybe a third-party integration. And then end-to-end -end test is when you really follow through the whole life cycle of a request all the way to the response, and then you'll see that everything works well together. And tying this back to the authorization section, how do you, you know, ensure that your test cases cover the different user roles? Um, so that becomes very important to making sure that you know, a bad actor isn't accessing information that they're not supposed to. This helps us to avoid unexpected behaviors uh, when the feature ships. 
However, there are some cases where, you know, it just can be automated and you just need a human eye to verify that the behaviors are expected. So how does testing tie into continuous integration? Continuous integration is the process where like developers integrate their code changes iteratively, continuously, um, and you know, th that can be verified with an automated build or an automated or suite of automated tests. So this allows us to introduce code changes confidently and iteratively. So no code changes with a failing build should be making it into the main branch or into production. And one more piece to the, the development stage is uh, the security review process. It's a very dreaded stage. Um, this is where they tell you like the hard, brutal truth, like this is not secure enough. Go back to the drawing board, make sure you add all these things. And this process can begin as soon as you start development on your feature, um, just so you can keep some of the security concerns in mind as you build it out. And it's especially important when you're introducing a new product or significant change, even more so if you're dealing with like sensitive data um, that are that's per pertinent to our users. So in a security review at GitHub, there are four main areas, application security, platform health, systems infrastructure, security, GRC, which stands for governance, risk, compliance. And I will briefly touch upon each one uh, with some example questions that might come up during the security review. So concerns that can come up with in an application security review uh, is you know, around significant changes on our GitHub product and code base. Does a proposed design introduce new or make changes to existing ones uh, in the authentication authorization patterns in the application or data access layer? Does it introduce a new third-party integration either client-side or server-side? And concerns that come up with, like, with platform health are around you know, GitHub's product and code base as well, but specifically to the health of it. So does the proposed design allow for new content types that you know, can be reported? Uh, and do they respect the spammy and suspended flags of users? Will this expose users to inappropriate content like spam and advertising, or you know, allow abuse of GitHub's or partner resources like <clears throat> Bitcoin mining, which actually happened? and uh, coupon abuse. Yeah, I was like, mm, yeah, that, that, that got shut down really fast. Um, and in the lens of systems infrastructure, the concerns are around GitHub's production environment. So does the proposed design change the way we distribute, commingle, uh, or attempt to isolate processing or networking? And do you have a well-defined and appropriate access control pattern in place? So like earlier, I talked about authorization, and this comes, comes back to it. And you know, making sure that you have the means to validate that they work. Again, testing into continuous integration. And then the last one, security, governance, risk, compliance. This is the one that just goes over my head, um, but it, it's about like third-party services and you know, are they used in addition to, or as part of this other service? And will you be adding a new feature or process to enable a new market vertical with like sensitive data, such as this one's more relevant in the US, like HIPAA, which is like health information about um, users or PCI. Another room. <laughs> yeah. So the security review team at GitHub is a team of experts, and they are there to help uh, ensure that you know we we are uh, above or we, are, we consider all the security risks whenever um, we're trying to roll out a new feature or a new product. So don't let that be an afterthought. Uh, it's really hard to like go back and rebuild a lot of the features when you haven't you know kind of thought about security uh, from the start especially when you're serving up millions of users, like you definitely don't want a security breach. Not say that it doesn't happen, it does. And that's why we have like the, um, the, the bounty program. Um, sometimes I'm like, I fix, I fix the bounty, but I don't get the money. It's like the bounty hunter gets the money. I'm like, can you just split it with me? No. Okay, so <laughs> super content heavy. Um, we are in the home stretch now. Uh, this is the last stage and that's the shipping stage. So we made it. Now I'm going to talk about the, the deployment process at GitHub, which is pretty straightforward. Um, when your changes in the pull request have been approved, it's ready to go, has a green build, automated testing, everything looks good. That's when you join the deploy the deployment queue, uh, and you can you know join as a solo PR. Maybe your changes could be a breaking change. It's huge. You don't want to mess it up for other people. Or you could join what we call deploy trains. So you, your PR joining a group of PRs and then the whole thing gets like you know, chunked together. Y'all go out together, happy train passengers. Um, and the first stage is uh, the rollout 
process, we go to production canary first. So 20% of the traffic that's served, that's where we roll up first. And like, you know, the canary in a coal mine, super loud when there's something amiss in the coal mine. So similarly, you want to see in 20% of traffic, will there be a spike in errors? If there is, it probably coincides with the rollout. You probably want to roll back, you know, maybe check the errors and make sure that it's not related to your code. If it is, definitely roll it back. Um, so this is, you know, a stage where you roll back before you fully are in production. And in order for us to gain better insight into our changes, uh, as they roll out to production, we have a bunch of observability tools. And I will highlight some of these that I find useful um, in my day-to-day. -day. Kind of reminds me of the slide that Marshall Ways had, the last slide where they had like all these tools. I'm like, I don't need all of this suite. Like I only care about my three, three of them that I use every day. So the first one that we can't really do without is uh, one that we use for logging, which is Splunk. Uh, you can think of this as the equivalent of like all your print statements in your application, you know, but the more sophisticated sister or brother of you know, your print statements um, where you can kind of customize and figure out like th these fields are the ones that I care about and you want to like surface in, the, um, in, in Splunk. Uh, and you can do this via like, you know, all these logging libraries or um, interfaces that are available in the open source world. Um, and you can customize the fields and important information. So, you know, you, you kind of know what to look up for in your logs if something goes wrong. And it's helpful when you want to see like where, you know, where your request is in a code path, maybe what values the request had at a certain point in time. And next we rely on Sentry. Sorry, I have to blur out a lot of things because I'm not sure what it's like confidential or not, but these are just a bunch of like error statements. It tells you like where in the code the error is, is at um, and like how often uh, it happens. So you can see over a time series, like, okay, that error is like happening all the time. It's probably very noisy. Or maybe there's a spike that you see, you know, in the tail end of the first error. So maybe something concerning that you want to look into. So Sentry provides just a very clear view of like the volume of errors that are over a certain time period. Um, it also highlights the ones that, you know, are errors that, you know, you might want to look into and are concerning. Uh, very helpful in when you're deploying your changes and silently praying that, you know, you didn't cause an error or you're causing an incident. Um, but that's what we look out for when we deploy our changes. So also you can tell like how many users are affected by the change. Sometimes when the error like affects one user, you just, ignore. Um, it's just too many. It, the real world is like just too many errors, right? Don't tell anybody, but okay. This recorded, right? Okay, when you click into the error, when you click into the error itself, though, uh, it can provide a, a whole stack trace of like, you know, all the lines of code, like just the whole tracing of where, um, you know, it happened. So this is very useful in pinpointing like the offending line of code. So another useful uh, observability tool is one of my favorites, which is Datadog. Uh, the Datadog dashboard is a, this, is, this tool is a great way to customize your dashboard into things that all these different widgets are like things that you can, um, you know, maybe you're interested in the, the request time of, um, you know, at, at a certain endpoint. So maybe you want to put that up there. Uh, maybe trends are, you know, what you want to see maybe over last week versus this week. Um, and it's just useful for like overall performance and, and you know, taking a look at, at different trends. Um, and each widget can provide different types of graphs. So very highly customizable. And the best thing about it is like, it gives you a quick snapshot of the overall health of you know, uh, what you're working on. And it's also shareable. So you know, you can, sometimes we have this thing where like GitHub goes down. I don't know if y'all ever you know, seen on Twitter, like GitHub is down, status.com, whatever. Um, but then this is where we go to the dashboard and you know, figure out, okay, it really looks like there's a ton of 500s. What's going on? Is there a DDoS attack? Like, you know, something that you can, you can rectify. Um, so super useful for that. And so let's say you realize that, oh, your data doc dashboard shows you your request time or response time is super slow. So how do you go about figuring out what a possible root cause could be? Um, at GitHub, we have several internal tools that we use. Um, one of that is like the flame graph. And you can feed it through this uh, app called SpeedScope. So Flame Graph itself, actually, the colors are like very red, orange, bright green. It causes you like anxiety. When you feed it through SpeedScope, it's like pastel colors, very calming, not a problem. <laughs> so that's why we like to like put it through SpeedScope. Um, and um, the you know uh, the, the thing is that 
the flame graph, like the horizontal bars, like the light green that you see or the light pink, um, they each represent a service call that's happening. And everything below that, that line is all the service calls that are involved within that first that, the service call. And this is great because it's timed, color coded, and it kind of tells you information about the like latency per service call. So like you can tell with like on this example, you know, capturing capture helper capture. Um, don't know why it's named that way, but capture help helper capture is taking like maybe three hundred milliseconds. So maybe you want to look into that um, particular service call, see what you can optimize. And another one that another internal tool that we use is. Um, it's one that you know shows us inefficient like SQL queries. So you can see the duration of some of the queries and you can sort them to be you know the ones that are the longest running on the very top. And the nice thing about this is it gives you the whole output of which query is the offending query. This was built internally by one of my coworkers and it very good, very good person. Um, but it helps us identify these inefficient queries so that you know, you, it is like reproducible because you have the actual query at hand. You can run it in, you know, the database console, try to tweak it and play around with it to make it more performant and efficient. Maybe there's a missing database index somewhere, you know? You know what I'm saying? Okay, so this same tool too can tell us, um, it can detect N plus one queries. And N plus one queries are where for the same, but it happens when your code is executing and it does, you know, and more requests or and more queries uh, um, unnecessarily that it could have to you know fetch the same amount of data uh, database records within like one query. So um, having the tools to identify that there's an n plus one query is already like half the battle won. Now the next half is just figuring out where that is and how you can rectify the n plus one. And a lot of times um, it's probably due to a missing clause to preload related uh, records. So here's a quick illustration. Before, um, we, we, if we didn't preload the data, uh, you will be doing like a query for every single maintainer profile ID. So for maintainer profile ID one, then we get the sponsorship levels. And then so you get five or N number of queries for what you could do after when you preload the records is you know, searching for all of the sponsorship levels from maintainer profile ID in one to three or five. So that's one query now instead of five queries that you had in the past or, and that's just for like five maintainer profiles, right? And imagine if you had ingested this whole array of um, maintainer profile IDs, could be a thousands, could be, uh, you know, a really huge list. And then your N plus one issue becomes a lot more exacerbated. Okay. Sometimes this happens, I just pace around. Uh, and one last thing I wanted to bring up is how we have different rollout phases at GitHub. Um, and we talked a little bit about feature flags and how we can control our rollout, which helps us establish um, the rollout phases on a, on a wider scale. So usually we roll out a feature inter internally to GitHub uh, staff, just you know to test it out within um, GitHub staff. I mean, we built GitHub and we use GitHub day to day. So we kind of know like, you know, to test out for what to look up for it. And so we can report the bugs to our hey, that team, you know, projects team, how come you have a bug, right? Um, and then once you get all of the bugs and, you know, feedback squared away, you might want to optionally go into private alpha where you select a few invite only people to try out your feature. Um, or it's optional. So maybe you want to skip directly into the public beta stage where, you know, you have users go on a wait list and then you slowly like, like them in, like them in through feature flags. Uh, and then once you have, you know, feedback from this group of like growing group of people, uh, you get, you gain more confidence and you like, you know, fix the bugs that come up and, you know, address all the user usability feedback or accessibility feedback. And then you're ready to go into general availability where the feature is now available for everyone around the world. Yes. Good question. Yeah. So was GitHub sponsors generally available in four months? It was not generally generally available in four months. It was public beta in four months. Yeah, and also because uh, one of the things that we had to depend on was Stripe. So Stripe is the one GitHub doesn't do any of the money handling. Stripe does that, so we integrate with Stripe, and they weren't uh, they weren't ready with their product to be generally available as well. So we had to kind of limit. We were limited by which countries they could roll out in, and it's still the case. So like we just expanded to Brazil because Stripe is now ready to expand into Brazil. 
And then you have to think about other things too, like legal sanctions with different countries, especially when you're in the US, you know, all these really matters. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so all that hard work paid off and you have you and your team have now shipped an amazing feature or launched a new product and it's time to celebrate. Um, don't forget to celebrate, even the small ones. So just as a form of retrospective, I like to recap the goals that I set out at the start of my talk. I hope you've gained some useful insight and information to what it's like to build software at GitHub. And I hope that you can apply that at school or an internship or you know, your future career at GitHub. <clears throat> um, yeah. <laughs> and some parting thoughts as I know that all this information can be very overwhelming. Uh, there is a lot, a lot, a lot involved in building a feature. There's a lot of hands involved in building a feature. It does take a village. And I want you to know that it's okay to not know everything. You might go in there and be like, oh my God, I don't know who to go to or like, I should know like about feature flags, but sometimes it's just, it's not something that is taught in school, I don't think. Uh, you'll learn it as you go and, you know, just have fun, have fun learning and adventures out there. So yeah, thank you so much for having me this evening. Some uh, GitHub stickers, of, so y'all can just take, because I just have too many and my laptop only has a certain real estate. Um, yeah. So any, any questions that I can answer? Yeah. I'm going to find out more about the database query optimization. Yeah. Uh, so when you put the indexes, do you all like specify, say like using a hash index or like do you all choose a different index and then how do you all decide what index to use? Yeah, that's and a great question. Also on top of that, I want to know whether you all uh, provided like, I actually uh, worked on like providing hints to the uh, DBM as to what query plan to use and at what stage you actually consider the problem. Yeah, yeah, we definitely do that. I think a lot of it, because we use Rails, a lot of it's like magically given. Um, when you, if you do want to like, you know, introduce an index hint, you have to be very explicit in your database query. Uh, and we have a whole team of like database infrastructure that are experts in these. So like they can also help us optimize this. So a lot of times what happens is that we're like, oh shit, it's like super slow. And I have, you know, I tried the index, I tried the covering index. I've tried all, like, you know, I've exhausted my means. That's when I hit up like the, the DBA, like, yo, <laughs> help me please. And they are, they are the experts. And so, I, you know, when, it says it, I, when I say it takes a village, it really does. And you have experts in other teams and domains that you can lean on for that. But yeah, I think it highly depends on the database you're using. For us, we use MySQL. So it just really comes with like whatever version we're using. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, at which stage would you actually, would, it, would, the, would you pass it on to the DB before like in parallel with you when you're like trying to first push it out or do you mostly do it after, after pushing or? I think we do it in parallel um, because you want to get ahead of these, these kinds of stuff. It's okay if you have a small subset and then you're like adding these hints, you know, over time. But I will give you an example. We have, you know, whenever you commit stuff on GitHub and you have this commit history, you look at your profile like, oh, very shook, all these like green squares, right? Contribution graph. But all that commit contributions, that's like, it, it's, you know, endless amounts, right? So how, and we can, it's kind of unbounded in a sense. And so we had to, we realized that there was this very slow running query and we had to re retroactively, you know, there's like hundreds and thousands and millions of commit contributions that we had to run this um, change over. So what we did was that, you know, um, I think in the back end, it's like, you know, kind of powered by the test, which is an open source thing that Google um, came up with uh to enable us to slowly migrate all these records and use a new index hint without affecting like existing users but we needed like databases you know coordination to do that and run that because it takes it can take you know three days four days i sat there like that, that pablo escobar law <laughs> yeah yeah great question yeah. any other questions yes yeah, so one of them could be like, you know, we introduce a new content type and then, you know, we didn't consider that, oh, you know, users cannot report on it. For example, if let's say somebody gave like spammy reviews, right, on your pull request and then all of a sudden you just have like, I don't know, like hundreds of, oh, it looks bad kind of review and it's not helpful. And if there's no way, no button for you to report spam, then that's a problem. So Platform Health, you know, in that aspect will look after it look for that kind of stuff and then stop you there and be like, okay, you need to build this into your uh, feature before we, we can roll out and before we okay this stuff. Other stuff could be um, like application security wise, if you didn't, I don't know, like, you know, uh, SQL injection or like things that 
you are opening up for like um, bad actors to perform on your on on your uh, on your platform. That's stuff that they look out for. And again, like you know, four different kinds of security expert groups that me as a lowly software engineer, like you know, I need to re rely on them to look out for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being just like real pointers for uh, any purpose. I think. Because I'm a software engineer on like the Rails platform, we don't really handle like you know pointers in for that language. But I will say that um, some of my coworkers who started, you know, so some some context is that GitHub was built on Rails. It's a monolithic monolithic app. Most of our developers work on this huge huge repository. But because of that, we've recognized that we need to split out some services into you know separate services. And so then exploring things like Go. Uh, some people are exploring things like Rust, and so that probably will come into play more than they will at, in, in the Rails uh, world. So one more question. Um, mm. So is there any specific reason why you choose to use Rust as well? Oh yeah, okay, so um, because we're trying to replace Rust APIs with GraphQL because of the whole uh, explicitness of GraphQL, like as a consumer of GraphQL, I want to be more like, I only want data back to me that I specify for. Versus REST APIs, you are kind of subjected to how, you know, us at GitHub, uh, um, we decided to give you back the data. So for GraphQL, it affords the consumers more customizability. Yeah, that's why. And I think it's like the, the future uh, versus REST APIs, which is kind of like a dinosaur now. Yeah. So do you also use gRPC for anything? Yeah, RPC? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very low level. Another team deals with that, and they do work a lot on like the performance tooling around Git RPC because at the end of the day, like everything boils down to like how fast they can execute, right? Yeah, and we had a bunch of folks that are were core uh, maintainers of Git RPC um, and and Git in general, and you know they they work on that, that team. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I have four limited stickers available. Um, for a pop quiz. <laughs> Name one thing you have to consider when you write your data. Structure. Huh? Structure. Uh, the one of the four things I mentioned. I heard index. Yeah, index. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, name one observ observability tool that we use at GitHub. You want to no. Sorry? Dog. 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 Oh, I don't know how I gave it to you. Oh. Yeah, I give you just one sticker. Sorry. No, she was like, huh? She was like, oh, yeah. Okay, I, I guess just come up and get it when you know you know who you are. Okay. Name all four rollout phases. Uh, oh, that's features. That's feature cycle. Yes. The rollout phases. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay, also, also here. Oh, yeah, yeah, just pick it up. Okay, last one. Don't be explicit one. Spoil if you close the product. Five, you do include the seven digits. You, you, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very specific. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last thing though. Um, is a little. Wait, I don't. I think I included this. Did I include this? Okay, so um, this one, Richard, might you might be able to offer more uh, information on, but I just want to do my job and, um, to uh, pitch this GitHub Tempest program. If you haven't already, like the your school administrator will be able to get you on this program, and so you get a very valuable GitHub Student Developer Pack with partner offers, access to virtual events, and workshop with industry experts. So you know, just make noise to your admins and say like, "Hey, we want this program." If you know, so then we can get you all on board. It. Yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Yuming. Um, Yeah, so just before we end, uh, we need to thank a few a few people, right? So Jet Brains for sponsoring today's food, uh, your chicha, your pizza, and the hangar for offering us this amazing venue to host this at. Um, last but not least, if you're not yet 
um, updated on our events. We post all our events on these Telegram channels, so maybe you can follow them. Um, yeah, other than that, I'm done. Uh, Yuming has left some stickers here, so please remember to collect them if you want one. And uh, Marshall Walls also have a ton of goodie bags outside uh, at the sofa area, so you can get one before you leave. Um, thank you to both our speakers today. Yeah, we'll see you again. <laughs>